Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the Exam Room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today, including in Mozambique, where we are the number one ranked nutrition podcast, my friends. So shout out to all the roomies <laughs> in Mozambique. And we are here today at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine with big time breaking news on ultra processed foods. There is so much going on and to talk all about it is a man who I, I love it whenever you are on the show. Dr. Christopher Gardner, welcome back, my friend. Happy to be here. Uh, you are very much in the nutrition game. Um, for those who aren't familiar with you, which is few and far between for the exam roomies, uh, you are quite influential in this world my friend i'm in the belly of the beast right now with all this ultra processed stuff uh, is your head exploding with everything that's happened in the past there is a lot and, and most the american heart released an advisory statement just last week uh six no eight months ago now the dietary guidelines for americans kicked this topic down the road mm. uh, just yesterday marion nestle slammed us and slandered us and marion if you're listening i do love you but i, I wish you hadn't slandered us like accused american heart of being schizophrenic Eesh. about some ultra processed foods being okay and some being bad the cdc just said americans gets 55 percent of their calories from ultra processed foods a study out of the uk said people on the ultra processed food lower their ldl cholesterol relative to the people on the minimally processed food diet and so yeah the, it's just it's a crazy time chuck and i'm ready to try to tease some of it apart i well you've just given me whiplash in 30 seconds here so i mean it is like crazy because i know some of the own uh, internal research that we've done here at the physicians committee on that as well is is kind of like well wait a minute maybe they're not all the devil that we thought that they are you can't lump them all together like you can't lump all carbs as unhealthy the same way you can't put now it seems ultra processed foods in one bucket either similar Okay, so let's get to the heart of the whole ultra-processed food. It's, it's actually an old category, an old topic. It goes back to pink slime in 2012. <laughs> Wasn't that does, what McDonald's was adding to yeah, the hamburgers? Yeah, does anybody remember the pink slime debacle from a long time ago? Was but it's ammonia sort of, in that? Yeah, ammonium hydroxide was used to take the scraps off the slaughterhouse floor to make mm. additives that you could fill some of your meat with, and that mm. was ultra-processing. <laughs> At its finest. Um, the new category actually isn't that new it, it's about a decade old and it was introduced by carlos montera brazilian epidemiologist who said you know i think it's more than just the added salt and the added sugar and the saturated fat i think it's all the cosmetic ingredients and the processing that's done in this food and he created this category saying you know the focus of this is not nutrition i think i want to do something agnostic to nutrition i'm going to do something with the purpose and the intent why are these additives and why is this processing done? And at, at the heart of it, I completely agree with the sentiment here because a lot of it is to get people addicted to food. Right. The food companies want even just a, a small additional incremental, uh, they want a small incremental piece of your stomach. And so all they have to do to get that is, you know, target another color, another flavor, something else. And so it seems kind of insidious and so I like it that he's sort of agnostic to nutrition. Right. And it's this extra thing. So on the one hand, I agree with that. We have multicolored marshmallows in some of our breakfast cereals. Mm. We have sort of neon gogurt that's not yogurt. No. We have we have some pretty ridiculous. We have cheese that you spray out of a can. Cheese whiz. I remember that from back in the day. You know, some of these things are like oh my God, what have we done with the food supply? Yeah. So that part I think is intuitive and it resonates. Yes, let's get rid of these. And RFK Jr. has said, yes, let's get all the ultra processed foods out of our school lunch program. It's like, who wouldn't want to cheer for that? Let's have school lunch be better. But when the American heart dove into this to get the full details on it, it's not as simple as it sounds, so can I elaborate? Let's talk about the complexities. Okay, so interestingly, in Carlos's own words, all ultra-processed foods are industrially processed, but not all industrially processed foods are ultra-processed. And that, so I know that, that I'm sounds pretty a circular. I'm picturing diagram in my head right now trying to put it together. And so here's the problem. So it's not, he's calling it ultra-processed, which in my mind, here I'm thinking uh, 
groats. Those are actually whole oats. Right. Steel cut oats, mm, they got chopped up, so they're processed a little. Rolled oats, overnight rolled oats, those got chopped up a little more or rolled. A little bit. And there's instant rolled oats. Those are processed even more. You don't have to cook them for hours, just minutes, yep. right? Yep. And oat flour is being added to things, and that's kind of how they make Cheerios. And so that's processed even more. But really, the only ingredient in all of those is oats. There's no other ingredient in them. They're just oats, but they're being physically processed. They're destroying the food matrix. Right. It, it seems like that's what people are thinking of when it says ultra-processed. But if you look at what Carlos Montero has been pushing is, okay, here's Cheerios. It has oat flour and it has 10 ingredients, including some vitamins and minerals. Here's frosted Cheerios, which mm -hmm. has grams and grams of sugar on top of the oats. But that's old school. We always said don't eat Cheerios. There's now cookies and cream high-protein Cheerios. See, and the high protein means that it's got to be healthy, right? Yeah, and they put pea protein in Cheerios with sugar and with cookies and cream flavoring. Yeah. And I think that's what Carlos is after. But if you look, that's part of the ingredients. It's not part of the physical processing of the oats that I was beginning with right, there. Right, right. So if you really look at the heart of what he did and what we did in our American Heart Advisory is we pointed out, set the physical processing aside. The big focus is two things, cosmetic additives and ingredients of rare or no culinary use. So I'm going to start with the second one because it's easier. Yeah, please. What the hell is rare or no culinary use? Probably so, something we don't want, to be honest. So it's sort of like, do you have high fructose corn syrup in your home kitchen? I do not. No. Does any self-respecting restaurant have high fructose corn syrup? No. no. So it's not of culinary use, but it's of industrial use. So it's really, it, it's cheaper to use high fructose corn syrup All right. than cane sugar. So it's easier Oof. to put it in more things. From a metabolic point of view, it is not any healthier. It is just the same thing. It's just glucose and fructose. But it's on this cosmetic additive list. Um, or actually, no, that's the one that's on the rare and no culinary use. The cosmetic one is flavorants, colorants, emulsifiers, glazing agents, uh, anti-gelling anti agents. There's all kinds of different things that are on this cosmetic additive. And I think the word is very cleverly chose. So the cosmetic is, we didn't really focus on the nutrition. We just wanted it to look good. We right. wanted the color to be good, and we wanted the smell to be good so that people would buy more of it, so they'd be addicted to it, so they'd eat more of it, and right. we'll make more money, and it will be a problem for the people who are addicted to it. Oh, don't I know it. So I, I, I kind of understand all that, but let's sort of go back to RFK Jr. maybe and school lunch, just as an example. So a lot of us know that school lunch programs have not all healthy food. Right. And let's pick something. So certainly a bunch of things like a pizza or something else would have tomato sauce. Right. If you look at many tomato sauces, and I did, I went to my local store and okay. I found nine kinds of tomato sauce. And uh, I had read on the internet that they were sort of an, an exception because they actually had tomatoes and garlic and onion and herbs and spices <gasps> and high fructose corn syrup, mm. which made them ultra processed. But that's not like multicolored marshmallows or neon gogurt or cheese whiz. It's like there's a little touch of sugar in this tomato sauce that we're serving the kids on a pasta or something like that. Is that as bad as all the other? Shouldn't we focus on the multicolored marshmallows before we focus on tomato sauce? So interestingly, when I went to my store, I looked at nine different brands, and none of them had high fructose corn syrup, not a single one. Huh. And a half of them had a little label on the front that said, we contain no high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> and so what struck me is sort of this discussion about ultra-processed food is potentially leading to the food industry recognizing this and reformulating. Right. So that's one of the wishes is, ah, let's talk to the food industry about getting some of the in these ingredients out. Yeah. I thought, wow, that's amazing. I expected to find all these tomato sauces with high fructose corn syrup. I'm not really as worried about tomato sauce as I am about other things, but okay. And they took it out anyway. Now let me look at the rest of the ingredients. 
Oh, they, they use sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup. From a, a health perspective, it, that's a wash. It's actually the same thing. Right. It probably just is pennies on the dollar more to them. Then I looked at the tomato sauce that I buy. It has no sugar. Right. It's just got tomatoes and, and herbs and onions and garlic, and it's twice as much as all the other brands. Now, this is one thing that I have never understood, is why is it that a item that contains fewer ingredients costs more money? And this is, I really think, where the industrially processed concept comes, the ultra process. So really, a lot of it is for shelf life and stability mm. uh, and producing in mass amounts. And so by adding some of these ingredients, preservatives, antioxidants, and things like that, you can sell it for less money. So there is, there's actually a whole list of benefits to processing, just in terms of lowering cost, making food accessible, making so that it won't mold, et cetera. But again, if you look, sometimes we've gone too far. Have you seen any of these videos where they like take a picture of a fast food hamburger on day one, day 20, oh, day yeah. 40, oh, yeah. day 360, and there's no mold on it, and there should be mold on it after all that time. Absolutely. So what the hell did they put in it <laughs> so that it was so shelf-stable that it never goes bad? Yeah, That's man. wrong. Twinkies in the same category as that, man. So really, it's been quite a struggle trying to figure out how to communicate this. Part of this is just a no-brainer. Yes, we have gone too far. The most markets are full of foods that have colorants, flavorants, emulsifiers, just like out of control. It's, you can't even recognize it as food anymore. On the other hand, part of that was to make a safe, affordable food supply. Right. And so American Heart's position on this is, you know, some of the things are better than others. Don't just across the board, if you look at this list of cosmetic additives or list of things of rare or no culinary use, if you just say none of those are allowed, you're going to throw out a couple things that are useful. Not many. Right. Not many, but for a school system that gets not enough money for school lunch anyway. Mm. If you took that tomato sauce out and say, go buy the tomato sauce Christopher Gardner buys, they would say, then I can't buy lettuce or, or some other thing because right. that costs more right. than what I have the budget for. So I think this has to be done a little more thoughtfully to recognize that even though Carlos Montero's idea for ultra-processed food is that it be agnostic to nutrition, yeah, I, I like the idea. Yes, there's something beyond salt, sugar, fat that is is wrong with the food system, most of the ultra-processed foods were, are already high in saturated fat, salt, and sugar. So we could kind of double down on those. Don't be completely agnostic to nutrition. Yeah. And then when you look at what these cosmetic additives are, you might want to give a couple of these, like a tomato sauce, a pass. Another one is, is yogurt, some of the yogurts that, that are out there on the market. We're not talking the neon green go-gurts now, are we? We're no, talking now, just yogurt. But but they do have sugar in them. A lot yeah. of us have said, look out for those yogurts that have a lot of sugar in them. But we were, that's not the ultra processed thing. That's the sugar. So look out for that. I looked at a whole bunch of salad dressings that had a bunch of these emulsifiers and cosmetic additives. You could imagine, you know, if you're going to go buy a salad dressing and you see it separated on the grocery store shelf, think, oh, I don't want that one. I want, I want the emulsified one where it's all mixed together and I don't have to do any work. But my next thought is when you buy that salad dressing, even if it does qualify for being ultra-processed, were you buying it to drink a glass of it or were you buying it to use a tablespoon on a salad with lettuce and veggies and things like that? So what are you going to use it for? And if the, if the really unprocessed whole food salad dressing is two or three times as much, I, I would probably give you a pass and say, I really want you to eat more salads. Yeah. And kind of raw veggies aren't as appealing as something that's dressed nicely. Right. right. So if you're just using a modest amount of this salad dressing, that would be okay. Another one that's in this category is a lot of whole wheat breads. Hold on. I know that our time is, is limited here. So I want to ask you, like you, you've mentioned that the category of, you know, these cosmetics ones. So what are the ingredients in particular that are some red flags? If you could just give that to the roomies here 
Uh, uh, that would be, I think, really helpful. I think it's pretty easy to pick out like red dye number whatever, green yep. dye number whatever. But what are some of the more complicated, you need five years of Latin to know what the heck they are kind of words and ingredients that we need to avoid? Not going to happen. So here's <laughs> the, so in our American Heart paper, yeah. we have a table. It's got 150 ingredients. Okay. Most of them are unpronounceable. <laughs> But he, so you can't just say these one or two. There's right. 150. Okay. Okay, but let's go to the belly of the beast and do a deep dive. Colorants are among these, and you just mentioned the dyes. Yeah. Among the list of colorants is turmeric. When used for the purpose of a colorant, it is in Carlos Montero's list hmm. of adding cosmetically to the food. So if you weren't going for the curcumin, and the health benefits of the herb, if you were really just going for the yellow color, he would be against it, according to this list. Gotcha. Pectin is in the list that people make jams and jellies out of and have been doing that for years. Vanilla is on the list for flavoring something with a little vanilla. If you go one by one through the ingredients, even those, you'll see, well, I don't think I'm quite as worried about pectin and vanilla and turmeric as I am about Hydra, Pyridillo, 6,2-oxy-moron, something. <laughs> there are some really horrific names, but it... So here would be my tips for the listeners. Yeah. So you can go to the Nutrition Fact panel and see salt, sugar, and fat, but that's actually not an ultra-processed thing. You can flip to the back and see the ingredient list. And first of all, if it has a ton of ingredients, it's probably... Not a great idea. You want it to have minimal ingredients. I have a little note of caution because as I was doing this and looking at a bunch of ingredient lists, this is particularly specific to breakfast cereals. Three quarters of the list is the added vitamins and minerals. Yeah. And some of them have horrific names. Yeah. Like vitamin B12 is cyanocobalamin. Right. How, how do you even that? pronounce cyanocobalamin? Well, you just say B12. Right. And then it wouldn't be as scary as some other things. So if you... If you look and see all the ingredients, first look, see how many are vitamins and minerals. I'd rather they were just in the food, but fortified vitamins and minerals are no worse for you than if it was naturally there. And, yeah. and maybe they're helpful. Look at the first two or three ingredients. It's probably going to say sugar is the number one or wheat is the number one or whole wheat. Right. But then so in that little range after that, look for the unpronounceable uh, unrecognizable, doesn't really look like food at all thing. And you could probably walk away from those, but I can't really give you one or two names because yeah. there's 150, 150 in this list. And again, if you went one by one, some of them would not shock you, but right. most of them you've never heard of before. So use that ingredient list as best you can. And hopefully the government and guidelines and... Groups like American Heart will help come yeah. up with some approaches to this that bring some sanity to this question. Well, a couple of things. Number one, we'll link off to that list of 150. So if somebody wants light bedtime reading, they can go over yeah. it and read at their leisure. Uh, two, I want to put a pin in the conversation because I know that time is limited here. But uh, we'll circle back. I'll bring you on for part two and we can continue to do a deep dive because I feel like, man, we're just scratching the surface a little bit right now. Thanks for having me, though, to introduce the topic. Appreciate you. Dr. Christopher Garner. Thank you, sir.